All right, hello everybody. Good to be back here today on Mother's Day. And no, I don't have a Mother's Day message prepared. <laughs> We're gonna talk about some of the stuff we talked about last week. And so I'm kind of excited about that and looking forward to uh, adding to last week's teaching. Last week we looked at the seven feasts of Israel and how each one of those feasts line up with the life of Jesus Christ, amen? And I have always wanted to teach on this subject and I thought to myself, well, this would go along perfectly with last week now that we're familiar with the feasts. So we're going to talk about first fruits, harvests, and gleaning. And Brother Mike, when you start studying stuff, you realize how dumb you are. Because there's stuff that we know, and then there's so much in the Bible that we don't know. Sure. That we just go, man, God is so smart. I can't wait to have that glorified body so I'll know. So I'm going to teach you today what I know. But when you get to the last one here, you're going to see what I don't know. And I have questions. And I don't think it's wrong to sh show you what I know in the Bible and then say, but what about this? Right. What about this? Because people will leave comments. Maybe they have an answer. Brother Mike, maybe after you can talk to us. I still try to figure this thing out. Now, um, Clarence Larkin talked about this. And this is the book, you know, Dispensational Truth. And he talks about this on page 107, actually before that, 106. And he talks about the first fruits, harvests, and gleanings. And this is definitely an important Bible doctrine. So we should talk about it. But when we start getting into these last ones, that's when it gets a little weird. <laughs> so what this is, is the doctrine of the first resurrection. So we're going to be talking about resurrection. There is the first resurrection and the second resurrection in the Bible. So let's start out today in Matthew chapter 9. Please take your Bibles out. And God gave Israel these feasts of Israel. Okay? And last week I gave you the seven feasts of Israel. I intentionally left off two. There's two other feasts that they celebrate that aren't in the law. One of those is the Feast of Purim. And we went to Pensacola one time to this, what, do you remember what it was called? Messianic or something? It was, it was people who were Jewish that said now they're Christians. And they have a church there in Pensacola and they had a Purim festival. And I said, let's go to that and see what that's all about. Boy, that was fun. That was fun to see what they do and how they celebrate. Um, Haman, was it? Haman and how he got, he got uh, killed because he tried to kill the Jews. And boy, the music, the Jewish music is amazing. It makes you just want to go, ha la 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 la. I mean, it's just, it's really fun. But that was really neat. So Purim, we didn't talk about last week, and that's in the book of Esther, and that's where Purim comes from. And we didn't talk about Hanukkah, the festival of lights. And some people argue that that is in the Bible, Hanukkah is, that Jesus did something on a certain day, and that's why he said, I'm the light of the world, because maybe that was during the time of Hanukkah or something like that. But I didn't want to get too much into those, but I did want you to know that they do celebrate two other ones as well. And so here are their feasts up here, and I went ahead and, and put, you know, the timeline, just for the sake of being scholarly, <coughs> no, just for the sake, sure as the world, I probably got something wrong. So if I did, you'll have to go to the comments and I'll pin in the comments what I got wrong. It's been a long week and I've been so, so tired. But the start of Passover here after the new moon, 14 days. Then 24 hours later, the start of unleavened bread. Then we've got the start of first fruits, two to six days. Now in Jesus' case, it was three days because he rose from the dead. Then we have the start of Pentecost, 50 days after. We've got uh, start of trumpets, 135 days later. We've got start of atonement, 10 days, 5 days till the start of tabernacles. And then 73 days later is the start of Hanukkah. You say, why on earth do we need to know all this? Well, you don't need to know it. But I do find it simply amazing. Something like 270 days. Do you know what the uh, gestation period of the human body is? 270 days. This thing works out like a birth cycle. Right. By the way, a woman's menstruation, they say, ties into the moon. Mm -hmm. And the feasts tie into the moon. And so you look at how this whole thing is set up. It's all a cycle of every year of planting. Planting and harvesting cycle. And so it was all about... And this is the Mother's Day sermon. Let's talk about menstruation. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Yeah, no, no, I didn't think about that. But, but what's amazing to me when you look at these feasts, they tie into the gestation period of when a woman has a baby. Yep. And what's amazing is you've got the ovulation and you've got all this stuff, and I don't want to get into all of that. But the baby starts to take its shape around this time. <laughs> 
a lot of people, you know, body of Christ, Pentecost, and the body starts to take shape. Yep. Do you know the baby starts to develop its hearing around right about there? Mm -hmm. Right about the time they start to go boop, 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 and blow trumpets. Right. Those babies in Israel, that would have been the first loud noise they would have heard from inside the womb. I mean, it's just coincidence, right? <laughs> or do you think that God in heaven knew all these things and was putting this in a way in which we could understand and then we could tie it into other things and say, man, he must know what he's talking about. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I thought that was simply amazing. Ties into the planning cycle, ties into the birth cycle. It's just incredible how you could deny that the Bible was written by God. I don't understand. Right. So we go back over here to first fruits, harvest and gleanings. And let's read Matthew chapter 9 and verse 37 and 38. This ties into the salvation of the soul and going to heaven. It's a harvest of souls. Yep. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 and 38. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into the harvest. Now go over to the book of James, chapter 5. James chapter 5. God is telling Israel to make a harvest of food, but in God's eyes there's a harvest of souls. And he wants souls to get saved. James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. James 5, 19 says, Brethren, and if any of you err from the truth and one convert him, see, that's why we have church. We want to see people converted. We want to see them saved. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude Amen. of sins. Saving a soul. So what we're going to look at today, and turn with me to the book of Exodus, is this cycle of planting and harvesting and how a farmer and what he does and how he harvests in God's eyes is like harvesting souls from the world. Yep. And do you know what first fruits harvest and gleanings is? Do you plant gardens? Maybe you're not a farmer, but maybe you plant a garden and you get out. Well, here in Florida, we start planting like in February, <laughs> sometimes January, but you get out there and you plant and you put out those tomato plants and you're waiting and you're waiting and here comes March, here comes April. And you look, oh, I got a green one. And you're excited. And one day you come out and it's red. And if you don't pick it, the next day the bird has picked it, right? But uh, you pick it and you go, oh, the first fruit. I can't wait. And you eat it. And it's all right. But then comes July and August. And there's so many you're giving away to your friends because you can't eat them all. And they're rotten on the vine. And that's the harvest. And you get excited about the harvest. Oh, and you also go, oh, now we got to go can some. We got so many, right? But then comes around September or so. And what do you do? You go, I'm so tired of, of tomatoes, but I still wish I had a couple ones on there. And you go out and there's the last couple of, and oh, those are the gleanings. And you're excited to get those last ones. Right. And then you go, well, now there's next year, right? So that's what the Bible is talking about here. And it's not just a physical thing. Right. It's a spiritual thing that yeah. ties into the resurrection of man yes. and God resurrecting us. And it's just simply incredible. Amen. So let's get started. Let's go to Exodus chapter 23 and verse 14. Exodus 23, 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Now there's seven major feasts, but three of those they had to come to Israel to keep. Now I guess the other four, I guess they could go home. But those three, three times they had to be before the Lord in Jerusalem. And he wanted them there with him. Okay. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded thee in the time appointed of the month Abib. For in it thou camest out from Egypt. And none shall appear before me empty. Amen. Uh, if you're saved, you don't want to go to heaven empty handed. You want some rewards. That means you want to serve the Lord. Amen. Plant some seeds. Amen. Of the gospel. And the fruit of harvest, the first fruits of thy labors, which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of ingathering. So feast of unleavened bread, feast of harvest, feast of ingathering. That's interesting. Which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. Look at verse 17. Three times in the year all thy males shall appear before the Lord God. So you had to appear. So three times they must appear before the Lord in those Old Testament feasts. You know what those correspond with? three times that someone's resurrected. Mm -hmm. Isn't that incredible? So let's go to now Exodus chapter 34 and verse 22. Exodus 34, 22. I enjoy this teaching, all right? Exodus 34, 22. 
And thou shalt observe the feast of weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Thrice in the year. Don't you love that word, thrice? I just, oh, that's such a cool word. Thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. So three times a year, they had to literally come to Jerusalem and appear before the Lord. We're going to see that that corresponds with three times in history when God takes somebody up and resurrects them. So this is pretty incredible, and I can't wait to get into this. And what are these three times? The Feast of Unleavened Bread, well, that's right here after Passover. So they had to show up for the first feast, okay? And that's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, so they had to show up there. What is that a type of? Well, Passover is where Jesus died. And then unleavened bread, he said, I'm the bread of life. He was down there for three days, three nights, but he came back up. He saw no corruption because leaven is corruption. So you had the first time was, and you know, a lot of times they take Passover and, and, and Feast of Unleavened Bread and kind of just lump that in together as one feast because it starts with Passover, then 24 hours later, then unleavened bread. But you know they have to eat unleavened bread on Passover That's too, right? right? Yep. So you have that one. I just want to make sure I got that right. And uh, the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost, Shavuot, that's the other feast they have to be there. So they have to be there for that feast. And where is that? Well, that's over here. Okay. And then the next feast they have to be in is the Feast of Ingathering, Sukkot, the Tabernacles. So you see them three times during the year. They are commanded to appear, make an appearance before the Lord. Okay. Remember that, an appearance before the Lord. So what does this mean? Oh, and by the way, first fruits, harvest, gleanings. Which one's the best? The harvest, because that's where you get the most from. That's where they taste the best. Right? Sometimes they're a little smaller, the first fruits. Sometimes they're not as good, the gleaning. So the best one is the harvest yeah. in the middle. All right. So we look at these, and what we find is that these three feasts are types of a resurrection that Jesus does. And without further ado, let's just get into this. I'll probably end a little early today, but that's in case we have some questions, because I'd love to have some questions, because I still have some questions, <laughs> to be honest with you. But uh, let's look at this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And Brother Ray brought this one up last week, and I'm glad he did. But uh, I used one verse, and Brother Ray went to the other verse, so he got ahead of me. <laughs> but that's okay. They're in the same passage. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20. And then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, we read this. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So when Jesus Christ went to Calvary, he died on the cross for our sins. So you knew I was going to do it. I have to put the blood up here. Amen. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins. He was buried and then he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, he rose again, and he's called the first fruits, plural, right? Mm -hmm. How could one man be a plural? Why doesn't it say first fruit? Why does it say first fruits? Because there was somebody that came up with him. And this would be your Old Testament saints. And let me show you this. This is incredible. They got a resurrection of their body. And so these Old Testament saints, so this would be the first one, the first, and, and they went up and appeared before the Lord. There's your appearance before the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter, and then we'll come back to 1 Corinthians, so keep your hand there. And uh, look at Matthew chapter 27. A lot of, of this is in the Bible, but I wish it would tell us more about it. <laughs> it's just like, and in passing, blah, 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 and here it is, and you're going... That's the most incredible thing that ever happened in the history of the world. Why can't we get more than just two verses on it? That's all we get. So Matthew chapter 27 and verse 51 through 53. Actually three verses, but Matthew 27, 51. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. All right, this is when Jesus died on the cross. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. What is that? That's the bodies in the grave of the Old Testament saints coming back to life. Mm -hmm. That's a resurrection. Yeah. And look what it says there, continuing. And it says, And came out of the graves after the resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Mm -hmm. Wow. What was that? That was the first fruits. Yep. So that's why it's in plural. So all those people in the Old Testament that were saints in the 
in the, what is the word, sin significación, I'm thinking in Spanish, in el sentido, in the sense, okay, in the sense of, in the sense of them being saints, when they died, they went to Abraham's bosom, they didn't go to hell. Now, why did they go to Abraham's bosom? Because they obeyed God and because they had a sacrifice, an animal sacrifice for their sins. But they were down there waiting to be resurrected. Their souls were there, but their body was in the grave. Right. And so the resurrection is when your body comes again. So their souls came out and went in their body and they walked around. Mm -hmm. Do you know how scary that would have been? <laughs> Talk about night of the living dead. Well, now they're the, the night of the glorified dead walking around. And who would this have been? Who would this have been in the Old Testament? Well, Joshua. Uh, I don't know, some of the Old Testament prophets, Malachi, Moses. Well, no, Moses would have been up in heaven, so not Moses. But all these Old Testament um, people that we read about in the Bible would have got up and King David, most likely. Could you imagine you're walking down the street, well, we finally got rid of this Jesus guy, and then there's King David going, repent, ah, who are you? I mean, it would have scared people. Now, it doesn't tell us how long they walked around. Some people think a couple days. Some people think till the 50th day, you know, when Jesus went. I don't know, but I know one thing. There was a resurrection of the Old Testament saints right there. Right. And then when Jesus finally went up in, in Acts chapter 1, they would have gone up with him. So there's your first fruits. And boy, don't you think the Bible should have more on that? And then just, well, that just happened. And you're like, I want details. <laughs> no details. You know why? The Jews didn't want to remember that because that would have meant that Jesus is who he said he was. So they tried to cover that up. I don't even think Josephus mentions much about that. They kind of just sweep that under the rug and go, nothing to see here, you know? Like, like a fireworks factory blows up behind you and the police are like, please disperse, there's nothing to see here. It's like, psh, 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 and everyone's going, ooh, ah. It's like, yeah, there's a lot to see here. Um, but there's a lot to see there. But what is that? I mean, that's the first fruits. Okay, are you all with me? Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Did you know that was in the Bible? There's a lot of churches that don't ever preach that. And yet that's in the Bible. So Jesus wasn't the only one that rose from the dead. He, by his power, took them up too. So there's your first fruit. See how it ties in with the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 23. Again, we're told Christ the first fruits. But look what it says here, added information. But every man in his own order... Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So there's an order of the resurrection. And the first fruits were the Old Testament saints here, then afterwards Christ at his coming. Now, Jesus Christ came twice the first time. He came born, then he lived 33 years and he died, then he went up to heaven, put his blood on the mercy seat, came back down, and then 50 days, well, uh, yeah, what was it, 47 days later, on Pentecost he went back up. So you see the first coming of Christ, the first advent has two parts. Why wouldn't the second advent have two parts? Right. Today, there's a lot of people running around saying, there's no such thing as the rapture, there's no such thing as the rapture. Okay, then you lose the type of the first coming right. because the second advent, the seventh coming, there's two parts. The first part is the rapture. He comes in the clouds, just like he went up in the clouds, he comes in the clouds, then he goes back up and then he comes down in Armageddon yeah. and then he destroys the Antichrist. So clearly there must be a rapture in the Bible. Amen. You know why? The rapture is the harvest. Yep. And let's go to, well, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, so let's go 1 Corinthians 15. We'll start in verse 35 and read down toward the end. And I want you to see this is all about a resurrection, and this is the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 35. But some man will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. <laughs> I find that funny. Paul calls somebody a fool. Um, a lot of people say, oh, if you call someone a fool, you're going to hell. So Paul went to hell. No, Jesus, I think Jesus called someone a fool one time, didn't he? Yeah. So there's, there's a time to call someone a fool when they're being foolish. Right. And so he's literally saying, why are you being so foolish to say there's no resurrection? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain it may chance of wheat or of some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. Hmm. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another flesh of fishes, and another of birds. And by the way, those don't mix. That's called bestiality, and that's right. a sin. You don't want to mix those. Two. And then it says, and by the way, there's a celestial body, verse 40. And they're not supposed to mix with man. Right. See Genesis 6 for further particulars. Mm -hmm. But it says here in verse 40, there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. Celestial is heavenly. In Spanish, it's cielo. And terrestrial, that's here on earth. 
But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another in glory. By the way, in the book of Revelation, stars are angels. It's kind of interesting. I don't know if that means anything here, but so also is the resurrection of the dead. So this is the context of this chapter, resurrection. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. There's the glorified body that we get at the rapture that I can't wait for. What a blessing that'll be. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam would be Jesus Christ. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. So before you can get up at the rapture and have a glorified body, you've got to have this body. Yep. So you've got to be born before you can be born again, right? That's just plain simple logic. In uh, verse 47, the first man is of the earth, earthy, and the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. He's talking to Christians. Boy, one day we're going to have a body like Jesus' right. resurrected body. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. And then verse 51 down to 58 is the rapture. Yep. Interesting that our flesh and our blood is corrupt. Mm -hmm. So if we have corrupt blood in us, you think we take that blood to heaven with us? You ever think about that? When the rapture comes, you get a glorified body. What do you leave behind? Your clothes and your blood. Yep. Absolutely. What if the rapture came, boom, right now? And all those that weren't saved that are left behind, there'd be a pool of blood. Mm -hmm. And you'd probably start screaming, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. You would probably have to go to an insane asylum and see mm -hmm. something like that and a pool of clothes and blood. I didn't mean to go there, but that's going to be creepy. And I think the devil wants our blood, so the Lord's just like, here, you just take it. <laughs> Imagine how stinky and nasty it would be after the rapture. How are they going to explain that away? Right. Well, here's what they'll probably do. Well, the outer space aliens did that mm -hmm. because those were the bigots that were intolerant and didn't like our way of life, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. pretty much. Anyway, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed yep. in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last Trump. Now, that's not Donald Trump, mm -hmm. although, you know, if he did get in office again, that'd be more proof that the rapture is coming. But anyway, um, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Now I could read the rest, but for sake of time, you read the rest here. This is the rapture. Yep. So the rapture is going to be a resurrection. So this would be number two. And who would that be? Well, that would have to be the church age saints. Yep. And the church age saints would be those who are saved mm -hmm. today. Amen. And so, like my dad died, his soul is in heaven and his body is here in the grave. Well, at the rapture, his soul's coming down and his body will go up. And then we'll all go up together. Now, we are alive and remain. She'll be caught up together with him. So we get a glorified body. We get changed. We all go up together. And this is the harvest. Mm -hmm. Now, the souls are already in heaven. Yep. But the body is going to come up. Right. So isn't that amazing? So let's go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 real quick. Uh, for all those people out there. And boy, they're coming out of the woodwork in these last days. Mm -hmm. And all they're doing is proving the Bible true because they're scoffers. Yep. <laughs> there's no rapture. There's no rapture. Oh, thank you for proving the Bible true. Yeah. <laughs> because the Bible says people will fall into apostasy, yep. falling away. And we believe the rapture. And they don't. So they just prove the Bible. Right. But the Bible teaches the rapture. And the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. And I have to go a little long on this because this is important. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So if you want to be ignorant, that's your, you help yourself. That you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. See, the rapture is our blessed hope. Yeah. You take that away from me, you're wanting me to be ignorant, and you want me to have no hope. No thanks. I know my Bible, and I've got hope. And the right. only hope I have today is the rapture. That's right. Because this world's going to hell in a handbasket. Yeah. And you're trying to make me look forward to something without the rapture? What do you got to look forward to? Nothing. Right. <laughs> Absolutely nothing to look forward to without Jesus. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That's their body asleep in the grave and their souls in heaven. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, three things, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Again, not Donald Trump, okay? And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That's the only comfort we have. That's a yep. comfort. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So, this is the church age saints, and this happens at the rapture, and that's their resurrection. Now, do they get to walk around like these guys back here? I don't know. Wouldn't that be creepy? If uh, when the rapture comes, it says the last trump. So, what's the first trump? <coughs> So maybe God blows the first trump and they walk around for a couple days, like back then? Wouldn't that be neat? I can just see it. I'm sleeping one day and there's a knock at the door. Who is that? At 2 in the morning I get down, it's my dad. I'm back. I'd be freaking out because he died 11, 12 years ago. But I don't know. Is it going to happen like it did back here? I don't know. But it says at the last trump, the twinkling of an eye, we go up. So I'm looking forward to that resurrection. Amen. And if we go without dying, well then... God changes us to a glorified body. What a blessing that would be to yes. go without dying. And there's a song like that. Oh, yeah. um, something, should we go without dying, caught up in the clouds. I mean, I can't remember the name of the song, but that's, that's a blessing. So there's your second one. First fruits, that was the Old Testament saints. Harvest, that's the church age saints, which would be what? New Testament. So that has to do more with the New Testament. These are those which trusted the blood of Jesus for salvation. Okay. These are those that trusted the promise of the coming seed. Because Jesus hadn't shed his blood yet, so they weren't trusting in the blood in the Old Testament, were they? But they trusted in a promise that someone will come one day, and he will take us. So you have that, and then we get into the next one. And uh, before we get to the next one, let me show you this. These people that go at the rapture, they come back down at Armageddon, yeah. and they'll be in their glorified bodies and reigning with Christ. Let me show you those verses real quick. Go to Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10. So... We get to live again if we're saved. That's why salvation is called eternal what? Life. Life. Yeah. But when we live again, we live again in a glorified yeah. body that can never fall and never sin. Right. That's what encourages me. I'll never be able to sin again. What a blessing that'll be. Amen. Revelation 5 and verse 10. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. When do we reign on the earth? In the millennial kingdom with Christ. Now go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and our Father, to whom be, or excuse me, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So we get to go up here and come down here and reign with Jesus yep. in our glorified bodies. Okay, do you all get that? I mean, that's pretty easy. Now we get into the other part that's a little bit harder. <laughs> this one I have so many questions about, and I, I'll tell you what I know and what I don't know. I'll just go, and I don't know what to say about that, you know, because I, I haven't quite got that together yet. But it doesn't matter. This is where we are now. This is where we get saved. We're in this dispensation. And I want you to get saved to go there, because if you miss that, it's going to be really hard to get that next one. And some people online, they're teaching, well, if you miss the first rapture, don't worry, you'll just go at the second. I don't see that. No. I've done a video on YouTube, the seven raptures in the Bible. There's no second rapture. <laughs> Whoops, I missed it. Well, I'll just get the next train. You know, No. Um, it's going to be way different in the tribulation than it is now. And so we're going to look at that. But after the rapture, I believe in a seven-year tribulation. Yep. And let me show you why I believe that the tribulation is seven years. Let me show you why. Because a lot of people out there today, they don't believe that. They think it's a three and a half year. Mm. They say back here was the first three and a half years and over here is the last three and a half. No. I mean, that sounds great at first, but when you read the book of Revelation, you do not see that. Right. Let me show you the book of Revelation chapter 11, why I can't, I can't swallow that. I can't believe that because I read my Bible and I don't see that happening. Right. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. This is getting exciting. I can't wait to get into this. Revelation 11, 1. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. A lot of people say the book of Revelation is already past. It's not future. Uh-uh. Mm. Uh-uh. It's future. Yeah. This is a future rebuilt temple. That's right. Did you all hear that in Israel they said this year they yeah. want to rebuild the temple? Right. 
and they're excited about doing that, uh, next week will be the 14th, May 14th. What a great time, 73 years for them to rebuild their temple. Whew. Getting exciting, isn't it? I believe the book of Revelation is future and we're seeing it. But look what it says here. And them that worship therein. So they rebuilt it and they're in it worshiping. Now verse 2. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Forty and two months is three and a half years. Yeah. But before that three and a half years they're in the temple doing something. Mm -hmm. So I could see them three and a half years in it and then being kicked out in the middle. And then the last three and a half years the Antichrist gets it. Yeah. Does that look like a future seven years to me? Yep. I mean, excuse me, to me, to you? It does to me. Now let's flip over to uh, Revelation chapter 13. See why you've got to know your Bible? Right. What I see on YouTube is people following men. Oh, well, this video says, well, that video says, well, that, and all they're doing is watching videos that some guy said something and they believe it. Hmm. Why don't you read this? Right. It's not wrong to watch videos, but always make sure what they're saying lines up with this. Yeah. This is where you need to go. Amen. Okay? Now, Revelation chapter 13. Verse 4 and 5. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. The dragon is Satan. Yep. Satan gives power to the beast, the Antichrist. That literally means that the Antichrist is put in power by Satan himself. Right. Now people say, do you think Joe Biden is the Antichrist? And I say, no. Uh, but I do believe that uh, the devil put him in because the Antichrist is biding his time until he comes on the scene. <laughs> okay, bad joke. But it is interesting how words have meanings. Somebody sent me something the other day where they said in Hebrew, the word Biden and the word Kamala. There are two words that are very similar. One means judgment and the other means destruction or something like that. Kamala or Kam Kamalaka or something. I, I don't even know how to pronounce it. But isn't it weird that their names in Hebrew sound like destruction and, wow, judgment? Hmm. You think the Lord's behind all this stuff? Oh, or it's just coincidence? Sure, a lot of coincidences, aren't they? Anyway, maybe it's not a coincidence. So here we are in uh, verse 4. Uh, and they worship the dragon, which gave power to the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So the beast is a powerful military leader mm -hmm. that has probably the greatest army in the world in his backing, and no one can fight him. Putin. Yeah, some think it's Putin, but I don't know. Little what does Putin mean? Well... We're not going to go there, but anyway, uh, it's a foul odor. But anyway, uh, so verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him, watch this, to continue. Mm -hmm. I hope you all have a King James Bible. Because yeah. if you have a different version, I think it changes that, yeah. doesn't it? King James says to continue 40 and 2 months. Mm -hmm. Now this is very important. If you continue three and a half years, then you must have been doing something before those... So does that sound like seven years to you? Yeah. I get it. Why don't others? Right. I see a seven-year future yeah. tribulation. I don't know why others don't want to see that. So what happens in the tribulation period? Well, Revelation 13, 11 through 18. We're there, so let's uh, read it very quickly. 13, 11 through 18. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him, and calls it the earth, and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Wow, he can do miracles. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Ooh, what a bully. I've always said the Antichrist is a stinking bully. I don't like bullies, do you? Neither does the Lord, it sounds like, because the Lord's going to get rid of that guy. And he calls it all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 600, three score, and six. So 666 is the number of the Antichrist. And this is when the Antichrist comes on the scene and he has his number. You ever hear that patent 060606? Ah, probably nothing to that. So anyway, but if you had wisdom, maybe you check out, you know, U.S. patent number 060606. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
might, might do you good to learn a little bit something. But anyway, so here we have this in the Bible. And if you miss the rapture and you want to be saved during the tribulation, is it the same as today? Oh, man, they all left. Okay, Jesus, I trust your blood. Okay, I'm saved. Sealed with the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Or is it different? different? I see it completely different in the tribulation. And let's go and see what he says in uh, Matthew. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24. And by the way, Matthew chapter 24 is Jesus speaking to Jews in the tribulation. Yeah, right. All right, there might be a couple things there where it might be a little bit before the rapture. Some of the things like earthquakes getting worse and things leading up to that. But Matthew chapter 24, Jesus is talking to Jews. Yep. And look what it says in verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Is that where we're saved today, enduring to the end? No. Well, if that's how we're saved, then everybody who didn't go at the rapture wasn't saved because they didn't endure to the end. Of course, how do you endure 2,000 years? You know what I'm saying? So this must be about that time over there. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. Now, for funsies, let's read verse 14 uh, up to verse 22. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. By the way, that's not our gospel. So that's a different one. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. That's in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist goes into the rebuilt temple and sits on the temple and says, I am God. Mm -hmm. See 2 Thessalonians, is that correct? Yes. See 2 Thessalonians 2, right? Yes. For further, for further uh, on that, further, what's the word I'm looking in for? In the book of Daniel too, but for further, what? I can't even think. For further reference, sometimes the words escape me. For further reference. So we continue here in verse uh, 16. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. All right, is that written to us? Do we have to buy a plane ticket to Israel so we can go into the mountains of Judea? If so, uh-uh, <laughs> I can't do that. So I guess I can't be saved. <laughs> I mean, does that, do you see how this has to be to Jews in that right. time? Yeah. Let him which is in the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. It goes through here. I don't have time to read it all, but verse 20. Neither on the Sabbath day. Jews keep the Sabbath. 21, for then shall be great tribulation. Now the tribulation is the first seven years. Yeah. And then the last three and a half years is called the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. And it makes a total of seven years. We call the whole seven years the Tribulation. But the last three and a half years, we call that the Great Tribulation. Yeah. Okay? And that's when all the wrath is poured out and all that stuff. And all that stuff takes place. But look what it says here in verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Who would the elect be? The Jews, Israel. And I was going to read a little farther, but that's about as far as I'll go right there. You can read the rest of that. And uh, well, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. And then there's all these birds that are feasting. Well, that sounds like Armageddon. So that's clearly applying to this time period. Now, go to Revelation chapter 12. Here's the thing. If you are a Gentile and you miss the rapture, you can't do that. <laughs> so, how do you get saved in the tribulation period if you're a Gentile? That's a good question. And the answer appears to be you have to get your head cut off by rejecting the mark of the beast. Right. And I'm going to show you those verses. But let me show you this verse first. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 6. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And it continues there and it talks about this woman bringing forth a man-child, verse 5. And he's to rule with a rod of iron. Well, this, I believe, is Israel. That represents Israel. And the man-child was Jesus. Yep. Okay, now verse 6. And the woman, Israel, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Yep. That's one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Do you know that's exactly three and a half years yes. or exactly forty-two months? Mm -hmm. The Bible's pretty specific, yeah. isn't it? People go, oh, that's just a metaphor. <laughs> And yet it gives you the exact number of days that something's right. going to happen. Oh, a metaphor, huh? That's figurative, is it? Mm. Okay. Uh, so it continues there, and I, I can't read the whole thing for sake of time. But she flees into the wilderness, and skip down there to verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So he's persecuting the Jews. Yep. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. Now, some people, you know what they say? That's America, because our nation has an eagle. I don't know. I would like to think that America exists during that time and they're still protecting Israel. But our country really isn't protecting Israel today, are they? 
So I don't know. I have hope that maybe things will change and we'll be good to Israel again, but I don't. But it is interesting that it says two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a times. Well, if a time is a year, a time, that's one times, that's at least two and a half a time. That'd be three and a half years. Yeah. I mean, it's just right there in your face okay. if you just simply read it. And it says for a time, times and half a times from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out his mouth water, cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. I wonder if that was an earthquake that did that. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound like faith alone gospel, does right. it? Sounds a little bit different. So today Jews don't believe in Jesus as their Messiah. And they will believe because there's two witnesses that are coming yep. that will witness to them and show them. And they'll realize, oh, it's Jesus. And they, they will begin to believe that Jesus was the true Messiah. But then God will have to protect them because the goal of the Antichrist is to exterminate every Jew off the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. So we see God protecting them. Now it makes sense. He that endureth to the end. Okay. And that group of Jews, if they can endure to the end, then they'll be saved and come into the millennium. Right. But what about a Gentile? How does a Gentile get saved? Well, go to Revelation chapter 6. If you're not a Jew and you don't convert to Judaism and you can't afford a plane ticket to go over there so you can flee into the mountains, then what do you do? How do you get your soul to heaven? Like we got our soul to heaven here by believing in the blood of Christ. How do you in that time get to heaven? Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. You have some people who are called martyrs. Do you know what a martyr is? Someone who dies for Jesus Christ. And it sounds like the Antichrist will be the one that kills them. Because he's going to tell the whole world, you take my mark. And that mark is connected with Satan and worshiping him, the dragon, Satan. So if you become a believer in Jesus in that time, you would say, no, I can't do that because I believe in Jesus. So what are they going to say? Well, then fine, why don't you just die? It's either die or take the mark. Um, okay, kill me. Now, how do they kill them? Let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. There's a thing called beheading. Yep. And it looks like the way that they will kill them. By the way, what, 30,000 guillotines yep. our government bought back in the 90s? Why would you have a bunch of guillotines waiting around? <laughs> I don't know. No, just coincidence. Again, uh, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? Beheaded. Yep. Beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Yep. So they live again, and they reign with Christ a thousand years. So this we would call, number three, I guess we would call these the gleanings. Mm -hmm. And these would be your tribulation saints. Right. But very few make it through alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like just the Jews do. Now there might be some Gentiles that somehow make it through. I don't know how. Uh, maybe they have like an underground layer and, and they get underground and they've got 20 years worth of food and they, pff, but you know how hard that would be? Mm. Um, It'd be very hard to do that. The best way to know for sure you're going to heaven if you miss the rapture is to be the first one in line for the beheadings and say, no, the Bible says my soul's up there, so please cut it off, you know? So get this. We're saved today because someone shed his blood for us. Yep. And we're trusting in that blood to get us to heaven. Amen. You miss the rapture, you've got to tell that person, I love you enough to shed my own blood for you. And now you've got to be willing to shed your blood for him who died for you, because you rejected him here. That's pretty sad, isn't it? But that's what it sounds like, is you got to be willing to say, you know what, I'm going I'm to die for Jesus. Now, there's your three right there. First fruits, well, those are the Old Testament saints. Harvest, that's the church age saints. Gleanings, that would be your tribulation saints. But now, i got a list of questions. Jesus comes back at Armageddon. Those that were beheaded, their souls are up here, so I guess there must be some sort of resurrection to get their bodies back. Do they get a glorified body like us? 
Do they deserve it? I don't, do they get a natural body? Does God resurrect them and let them take off again like they were before in a natural body? We don't get a natural body. We get a glorified body. So do they get a glorified body? See, I've got questions. I don't know. Um, we go to the judgment seat of Christ. Do they go before the judgment seat of Christ when they die? What would they be judged for? What would they get a reward for? Except, here, you, you love me enough to cut up my hand. Okay, here's a robe. And that's the only reward they get or something. It's different because the Bible says that we today in the church age are washed in the blood of Christ. He washes us. He washes our robe. But it says about them, they wash their own robes in the blood of Christ. So there are differences between the church age and the tribulation. Right. And the best thing to do is to get saved now because yep. the harvest is the best. Don't be one of the gleanings. Right. But if you weren't saved and the rapture takes place, you better be willing to let your head be cut off rather than take the mark of the beast. That's what the Bible tells. So I got lots of questions. Do tribulation saints get a glorified body or are they back in their natural bodies? Do people get saved in the millennium? How does that happen? You ever think about that? Millennium is a completely different thing. There will be Jews that make it through the tribulation and then they get to populate in the millennium for a thousand years. How do people get saved in the millennium? When is the next? Well, all this from here to here is called the first resurrection in the Bible. Then the Bible talks about the second resurrection, which would be the dead that died during the millennial kingdom. Now, if we're saved, we can't die again. We get a glorified body. So do you understand the difference between the glorified body and the natural body? We get into all this in our glorified body. Some people make it through in their natural body, which means they're still going to die. You all with me? Yep. Okay. So how about the millennium? Well, that's a good question. I've always wondered about those people in the millennium. But anyway, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. Let me show you this. At the end of the millennial kingdom. I think I skipped something. Yeah, I did skip. Let's start in verse 5. Revelation 20, verse 5. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. So all these people, the first fruits, harvest, and gleanings, that's all the first resurrection. Yep. Then the millennial kingdom. Then the people that died and all the people that died back here that weren't saved, they come up here at what we call the great white throne of judgment. Right. And they are judged and they are pitched into the lake of fire. But I guess some of them might make it, those that are in the millennium, that, that did serve the Lord. But remember, at the end of that, there's a huge rebellion by Satan. Yep. So, Revelation 5, excuse me, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Amen. On such the second death hath no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up, on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire came down from heaven out uh, fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are now let's read verse 11 and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them and I saw the dead small and great stand before God and the books were open and another book was opened which is the book of life and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Thank God I won't be there, because right. I went to the other judgment, the, the judgment seat of Christ. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Yep. So there you have the first resurrection and the second resurrection. We have maybe a couple minutes if anyone had a question. I did my best to explain that. Any questions, any comments? Brother Mike, do you have something to add you want to add? Anybody have a question or anything? Yes, ma'am. The temple is going to be rebuilt. Right, the temple must be rebuilt, yes. But everything is going to be destroyed on the earth. Right. The destruction of the earth, where everything is destroyed, is at the end of the millennium. But Jesus is going to sit in that temple. So will that be rebuilt, God, not destroy it? Well, so you've got the Antichrist coming into that temple and sitting there and saying, I am God. Now, when Jesus comes back, he's going to defeat the Antichrist. So is that going to be the same temple? Or is God going to tear it down and rebuild it? Either way, it's in the same spot. So I don't know if it's 
Jesus says, I don't want to sit there. I'm going to rebuild it. Or, but it's still, that's the same temple in the sense that that's the same spot. And the Antichrist, he always wanted to be God mm -hmm. and say, I am God and sit on God's throne. And the best he can do is sit on that throne. <laughs> and the Lord still boots him out anyway. Yeah. Amen. Maybe because of all the sin of Satan, he'll just be it, it could be. Um, it could very well be that when Jesus comes back at Armageddon, he goes there and he says, now tear this down. We're going to rebuild it again the way I want. I have a video on YouTube about the seven tabernacles and how I go through how there's seven of them all total. And I forget what I said on that video. I got to go back and watch it. But it could very well be that God rebuilds it the way he wants it because the Jews are rebuilding it the way they want it. So but either way, Jesus is going to sit in that temple and rule for a thousand years in Jerusalem on the throne of David. So amen for that. Anybody else? Questions? Boy, we got into a lot today. Yes, honey? So in the first verse, the verse says, and many of the Old Testament saints arose, right? So yes, got, many of the Old Testament saints. not all of them? That's a good question. Many of them which slept arose. Um, is that all of them? I don't know. But it sounds like it cleared out Abraham's bosom because yeah. the Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. So it took out all those. But um, that's a great question. <laughs> Many must be all of them or something. I, I don't know. But what else? What else? Anybody else? Okay. It's time. So thank you for listening. Any other questions come afterwards because I like to talk about this stuff and I hope it's been a blessing. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.